We're Mark and Alice, a couple who left the UK in search of somewhere to build a homestead and connect with nature. This led us to Alentejo, Portugal. Follow us on our journey as we we'll build our homestead, learn to live more self-sufficiently and acquire new skills in farming, permaculture and more. Hello and welcome back to our farm here in Alentejo, Portugal. So we're down here at the uh, swamp. Uh, that's all I can describe it at the moment. Um, the bottom of the land where it got extremely flooded. So in this video, we're going to talk through our plans for this part of the land from now on. And I'm going to start to uh, start to re remove some um, of the stuff down here to make way for what is hopefully going to be a pond. We've got someone coming tonight who's an excavator uh, guy who's going to um, talk through our plans and kind of what's doable and what's not. Um, I've been making a lot of uh, notes, videos, uh, plans using contour maps and stuff like that on trying to focus where the water ends up or where we can effectively root it um, and build up other areas to stop water from flowing through the land like it did last time. We're hoping that we know enough now to be able to make the best plan possible. Uh, this is not our usual area of expertise, but something that we need to do as part of the land management. Uh, I think th our plan's gonna work. In my head, it definitely works, but uh, we, we shall see. So yeah, as I said, I'll talk you through our plans in this video. And also I'm gonna be starting to clear out this area as half of this veg garden is going to be part of the pond, which would be um, also this area as well. So it's going to be fairly big.
one of the next jobs was to cut down and burn as many of these invasive grasses as we can. Initially when we moved in we thought they were bamboo, but um, they're pretty useless compared to bamboo as they are really soft. They dry out and are hard for a few months and then they just go all brittle. So the fire we did here wasn't really much of a success. It did burn a fair bit and obviously we've got some biochar and stuff for the garden now. But as you can see it's like hardly even made a dent. I've still got all of this to go as well. I mean we're not going to go all the way back as I think it's holding some of the bank for the stream and the other side of the stream isn't on our boundary. It's only this side. I think we're going to have to find a way of doing that more effectively. I think we're probably going to have to cut a lot of it down let it dry out a little bit and then burn it. I think it was because it was still quite moist, it just was really struggling to burn through. Yeah, so I guess we'll have to think of another option there. <laughs> ah, brilliant. Snapped. Snap there. Back's come off. <laughs> We're not having much luck with this polytunnel. And this is the current situation with the polytunnel. So I was hoping that after the flood damage we could have started to put things back together, but um, this is uh, snapped on that side, this is snapped. This is snapped, this is snapped. And the bottom is all out of shape and it's snapping. And uh, yeah, all of the structures here are snapping, so it's a, a little bit frustrating. I think this, this polytunnel has had its day, which is a bit frustrating because I think the previous owners only had it up for like six or so months before we bought it. So it's not really that old, I guess, like being battered by floods and then the winds we've had recently have just been absolutely nuts. So because basically the flood, uh, the floods have bent everything out of place, the cover has come off slightly. So we, we um, managed to get it back down and uh, just about secured underneath, although it wouldn't pull really tight because everything's kind of moved out of place. What's happened is the wind has got underneath it and just ripped, ripped it off which is a little bit annoying. I mean, the stuff that we have growing in there is actually doing really well. Don't know how well it'll be doing now. We've uh, not got a cover on it, but as you can see, like the broth spout's doing really well. The kohlrabi's doing okay. These turnips are doing pretty well. Don't know when to harvest them. They're getting getting uh, quite big. Broccoli, got cauliflowers. I mean, normally they take ages to head like that. Another one there. I don't know these the, the orange ones. Um, and then, yeah, we've got broccoli, little broccoli heads coming up. It was really, really cold last night. I think it the, I think it went to zero degrees. It was, there was a lot of frost around this morning. So yeah, need to come up with another plan for this polytunnel. We have actually got another polytunnel, which is slightly smaller than this, two meters smaller. I think we'll keep the parts anyway, just to kind of use for like spares in the future. Obviously it's quite a big structure, but you know, everything's, everything's snapped. So the other polytunnel we've got is from this company again. So it's the same, basically the same one, just a bit smaller. I think we're going to try another brand as well, just to kind of see if there's any, any better durability as we wanted two polytunnels anyway. Guess we'll have to have a think about this and try it, see if we can move it around a little bit, but yeah, the frame's just completely toast at the moment. So not great. <laughs> So this is what the polytunnel looks like now. Basically the 
some of the frame at the back and the cover was ripped. I've actually got some poly tunnel repair tape, but it was just way beyond repair. What I had to do was basically cut the poly tunnel down a little bit. So we've basically got like a smaller poly tunnel now from this one. Um, hopefully this uh, keeps us going until we get some of the other ones up as we still need to grow stuff in here. Some of the rips were actually quite useful to kind of work out where we could get it to. And then uh, we basically had to cut a couple of slits in the cover and then put it over the frame. I'll show you what it looks like from the back. Here we go. So you got like two and a bit meters off there. So uh, yeah, hopefully it will do for now and hopefully no more accidents. So the entrance was here along with this, uh, the bench was right in front of it. So we pushed it back because the fence is down as well, right at the back. Obviously there was gaps for you know, animals to get in and stuff like that. So this kind of reseals it again as well. Now I'll talk through what we learned from the flooding in December and then go over some of the plans we've got for the land. So I started off with this contour map, which um, you can get from Google Earth. Uh, you can see my permaculture part one video for how to do it if you want to do it yourself. First off, you can see how many hills and areas that the water is flowing from. And in the sort of blue channels I made, those are where most of the water collects and then runs. Right at the bottom where it forks is basically the bottom point of the valley. So as you can see, our house is actually more than safe for any flooding, but we need to plan more for everything else down the hill and try to come up with more places where we can slow the water down further up. The black boundary is our land and the dark blue spots are where water was uh, either bottlenecked or collecting a lot. The light blue channels are just where the water was flowing from. So because most of the water was actually coming from points that weren't on our land, there's not really loads we can do to continuously collect that water. However, here I've put where we maybe should put some ponds. The top blue circle is where we're definitely going to put a pond and we'll probably do the middle circle as well and uh, where the other circle is will have a uh, kind of stream run into the pond in the middle. The red lines are swales just based on where we saw a lot of the main amounts of water coming from. Obviously these uh, look quite big so what we'll probably do is end up breaking them up depending on the obstacles and stuff within the land but it's something we'll have to mark out more accurately when we come around to doing it. As we've got three hectares, obviously it's quite a lot of space to plan all of this stuff out to begin with. So our biggest problem area was the bottom end of the land. So for now, we're just going to focus on that. So I'll talk through the plans for the lower part of the land, which I've already discussed with the excavator guy. And uh, we'll be likely going ahead with these plans uh, unless there's any kind of new information or I sort of change my mind in the meantime. So this is where we plan on putting the pond, which is where a lot of the water seems to collect anyway. So it seems like a sensible location for it there. We plan on making it about one meter deep. Not sure exactly how big it's going to be in terms of size, but here's a little graphic on the map just to show roughly where it's going to be. So the original plan was this part is going to be all raised from the dirt that's dug out from the pond. And then we were going to just literally move the polytunnel over onto here because it's raised ground. Basically, we're going to get it in line with these wells. And then the uh, any excess water that comes down here would flow into the pond and not be not affect the polytunnel. But obviously that's uh, polytunnel is a bit in a bit of a state at the moment. So um the likelihood is we're going to put the other one up here we got time on our side we're in a state of hope i need you on my fire i want you to know that every time you're away so as we did intend on keeping the big polytunnel down there 
The second one we were actually going to put here. And I think we're still going to do that. Uh, like I said, I think we're going to try a different brand uh, for that just to see um, just to see like the difference in quality and stuff. Slightly smaller one here. Need to move this cherry tree. But yeah, it, this is quite flat anyway. And obviously right near the well, so good for water. Um, so yeah, we're gonna put that one there, I think. So providing uh, this veg garden actually uh, works well, uh, we're gonna extend this out along here, along this bank. And then this swale is gonna come round to this path and uh, we're gonna make another swale over there as well. So a lot of the water flow from our land comes down this way, along this path, and then down, and either splits off this way or goes down that way. Most of it goes down that way. We get a lot of runoff from these other lands, which comes down here, across, and down this part of the land. So once it gets down to here, a lot of it comes down and goes into the swale. The rest of it comes down this path and some of it goes into the swale as well, but the rest of it goes round this road or this tractor track that I've been using and goes into that other swale. Any overflow from here, it comes out here and again joins us this track. There is a spillway over there, but this spillway is actually slightly lower purposely because we want to direct as much water as possible down to the track, which would then go to the other swale. We're going to dig another swale down here, again for overflow uh, and collecting more water and we'll plant some more trees along there as well. So effectively, all of these swales would basically stop the water uh, running down the land too quickly, trying to collect it in these pockets. And then ultimately, if it all overflows and we get heavy amounts of rain, it would go and carry on down this track and feed the pond, which will be right at the bottom. So all the water from this part is being channeled that way. The water that comes down this track, which uh, is quite a large chunk of it, uh, will come round this track here, where the tractor's been, and flow down and beforehand where it was going that way, past the polytunnel or through the polytunnel, because we're raising this ground here, it will just uh, feed straight into where the veg garden is now. And that's where the, the start of the pond will be, just in there. So that um, this would feed there directly. Obviously because of the slope and stuff, it does slow down the water a little bit. So it, f it allows water to soak in the ground a little bit, which then feeds these trees. Historically, it looks like this track had come down and then actually fed this waterway on our other land, which goes down there. So what we're gonna to have to do is dig this out a little bit so that basically it allows the water flow to be better. There's like a, a dead oak tree trunk in there and there's quite a lot of debris and stuff. Uh, brambles were uh, kind of holding up a lot of the leaves, which uh, was causing some of the overflow to the land here. But um, yeah, that could, that will take away any excess water from uh, this land. All of it comes down here and flows across here. So clearing that would mean that there's no blockages there next time. This is where we plan to put our track 
for the tractor and stuff and they'll also play an important part in carrying water and directing water to the pond what makes the sun go to sleep every night and what's it dreaming of i wonder so at the moment we do have a lot of uh, build up here from where the tractor's been this will be a, a track and all of the excess water would again uh, be, flow into the pond over here we'll likely do, dig another trench or a little swale along here um, and plant a couple of trees to shade this part of the pond. I think it would be sensible to do that. Always keep on pouring down. When it's Next, we're going to add in the paths, which would also have the same function as the roads in terms of uh, directing water to certain points within the land. So a lot of the flooding issues we had was because this stream was severely blocked up, especially in the top bit there, there's hardly a ditch. So what we're gonna do is dredge out this stream along here to allow for easier water flow so that other person's land doesn't really get as affected. Although with the amount of rain we had, it was kind of just spilling over and stuff. But again, having the pond here, and we're gonna there's gonna be space to walk around it and stuff like that. Um, that can take any excess water, but also having the stream cleared out would just mean that there's more of a clearer path for the water to go so that it doesn't kind of just flow through this land. Uh, it goes sort of like in parallel to the pond, if you like. It really makes me so I think this is all gonna work. We don't know. I guess uh, the only way is to, to try it out. I mean, we've been trying to observe and get as much information from these floods as possible uh, to allow us to plan effectively. I think this will work based on the water flow and where the water's going and how can we can manipulate it to then um, go into swells and you know plant more trees and everything. So I think this is going to greatly benefit this part of the land. Obviously, we've got still got a lot to do on the other land as well, but um, this is sort of more of a priority for us. Yeah, I mean, interested to hear if anyone would do anything differently. I mean, obviously. Uh, it's hard to tell all the gradients and everything from the videos but, but obviously i've put some of the contour maps in this video so you can kind of get like a a rough idea of where where the water goes and where it's been collecting and everything so hopefully it works <laughs> Thanks for watching and I hope to catch you in the next video. We're not having much luck with this polytunnel. Flooded.